Greetings to everyone and welcome to another episode of Teacher Talk. My name is Christopher Hansen. I have the incredible privilege of serving my community as the Director of Music Education and Orchestral Activities at Seattle Pacific University. And this is an incredible opportunity that we created several months ago now to stay connected during the pandemic. Uh, for those that might be watching for the first time, I work with a lot of future music educators and art educators. And when we shut down our university, when the pandemic began, we wanted to stay connected, keep challenging ourselves and dialogue. And so we created these teacher talks as a way to just engage with people now from all over the world about the transformative power of the arts. And I am floored to say that it's still going on some 44, 45 weeks later, we're still doing this and I've committed to go a full year. Um, and so we have several episodes left in this series and thank you to everybody that's been watching. If you're watching for the first time, I hope you enjoy this dialogue with someone that I am incredibly blessed to call a friend and a colleague, the extraordinary Ms. Danielle Wright. Um, she's here today to talk to us about a lot of things, but most importantly, the idea that your art is not necessarily your instrument. It's sort of Ooh, the tagline yes. for today's episode. And I am excited to get Danielle's perspective and have you learn more about her and what she's doing and hopefully get plugged in to the, the work that she's doing, particularly with Apamoto. Shout out, hashtag Moto. Um, and some amazing things. She's in Detroit. And so she's going to tell us about herself in a little bit. But I wanted to finish sort of a brief introduction, give people an opportunity to tune in. Uh, this teacher talk is officially sponsored by a student organization at SPU called the Falcon Feathers that stands for Future Educators in the Arts, Transforming Human Experience and Realities. You didn't even know an acronym could be so awesome. And uh, these are amazing group of students that all have aspirations to go into education and particularly education through the arts. Mm. So I'm so excited to give a shout out to all of my students that have been watching this series and have been engaging in the dialogue. And I want to make sure that you know, even though you see two people on the screen, you are also encouraged to please be a part of this conversation. So we are live streaming on YouTube and on Facebook. And if you have comments or questions or affirmations, whatever it might be, please feel free to add those into the comment box and it'll pop up for us and we'll bring those into the conversation as soon as we can. Thank you again for watching. We're so happy to have you. Uh, Seattle Pacific University is a Christian institution. And so I usually start with a brief moment of prayer and reflection. Whatever prayer means to you, however you practice that, I think it's important for us to just reflect and take a moment to be grateful for the opportunities that we have to connect with others during this extraordinary time. So if you will, please join me. Lord, thank you on this day to be able to connect with another human being who understands and appreciates the importance of arts and education in our communities. God, I'm grateful for Danielle and the amazing work that she's doing. I'm grateful for the technology that you've enabled us to have, the privilege that it is to be able to connect and talk openly about the work that we are doing. Mm -hmm. I pray that the words that we share inspire others, God, whether they're listening right now or they might be listening later as, as we record these episodes and share them with others. I hope that they will hear these words and be moved to continue doing the work that they're doing mm -hmm. or to explore the opportunities that the arts offer us in education to transform people's lives. God, in all the work that we do, I hope that we grow closer to you. And again, we thank you for this opportunity to have dialogue about the work you've called us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So Danielle... Tell, I mean, <laughs> I am so grateful to know you and the stuff that you're doing, but for Same. people that don't know you, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're coming from and what are you doing right now? Um, it's been a very interesting journey to get to where I am. <laughs> uh, I started looking at my life in like chapters um, of like the book of Danielle, because I felt like that was a little easier for me to like um, explain and or for me to reflect on. Um, and so like, to me, there's like the time with my parents, like till I was 17 pre-college mm -hmm. is a big chapter. Um, and then college, I went to the U University of Kentucky um, and that was a chapter. And then I moved to Houston for four years in between after University of Kentucky. And that's where I decided to go to Westminster Choir College. Nice. Um, where I uh, have a double master's in pedagogy and perf, uh, performance, vocal performance. Um, and then I stayed in Princeton for a little while. And that's where I founded Opera Moto. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and I actually had been, by the time Upper Moto was officially founded, um, I had mounted like 10 shows or something, wow. like starting in Houston. Um, I just kept getting frustrated. And th- mm, I think it's more known now um, what the operatic system is. Like usually you can't get a role or even get an audition for like um, A, B, C, or D house, which are how opera houses are structured, mm-hmm. unless you have something on your resume and the outside of college, right? Yeah. Or outside of university study. And most of those would be pay to sings. Like you would literally have to pay for this experience. And a lot of, I mean, like uh, it was definitely worth the money in the way that you were, if you were thinking of it as like a supplemental education thing. But to me, it's kind of crappy how that was set up as like the standard. And so like for me to, um, like I did opera in the Ozarks two years in a row, which was an amazing experience. And because I had like very strong administration skills. Um, I could support with props, um, costumes, whatever. I would like hustle all my side hustles uh, to get money and or more scholarships that I wouldn't have to pay. But like that program was like $4,000 for two months. Um, And then on top of it, I had to make sure all my bills at home in Houston were still paid for. Right. Because I'm not going to like, go ahead. Well, and I, I hate to interrupt you. I really do. But I, I want to offer the clarification, especially for my instrumental peeps out there. That was so foreign to me. And I am, I am so blessed to be married to an extraordinary mezzo who, who suffered that same fate and bemoans it all the time appropriately, this idea to pay to sing. And when we were actually, when we were dating, we were getting towards the summer and we were going to do a festival uh, the national music festival up in the Northeast. And I was getting offered money to come and pay uh, to come and participate. Cause I was going to be like a violin mentor or something. And I was trying to sort of negotiate it uh, so that she could also get some money. And she was like, I've, I've never been paid to come and like sing with something. I don't understand that. Isn't this a, and she said, isn't this a pay to sing? And I like, in bewilderment, I'm going, what do you know? Why would you pay to go make music for, they should be paying you. And had this like earth shattering realization that vocalist experience, especially those that are in performance is nothing like an instrumentalist. So yeah. people watching, it is, it is insta- it's insane to me. It doesn't yeah. make sense that it's such a double standard that vocalists would be expected to pay to go perform in productions that are making money. Right. Like, I don't, I just had to offer that clarification because if anyone is like me as an instrumentalist, they're just like, no, you're wrong. That's not, that can't be a thing. And it is. Yeah. I've, I've had to have that conversation so many times. And like, that was like the catalyst of Moto being formed because like, I got really frustrated by this. Um, and like I was living, um, with my best friend, Amanda, who is friends with Chris and Aaron as well. And I was like, she was in rice and like not getting cast in things. And I'm like very frustrated because like, I know her gifts and talents. And I was like, well, what if we did the medium? And I was like, oh, I've yeah. done Baba. You could, you would be an amazing Monica. Um, there were plenty of people in our circle who also wanted opportunities that were local in Houston to not have to pay for it. Um, I had uh, access to an incredible music director who um, is that main coach at Baylor University. Mm-hmm. Like we had all access to all these people. And I was like, we can do this. We don't, and nobody will be out money and we'll work around people's like, working schedules or whatever. So um, I was like, oh, I really love doing this. (laughs) And I've, you know, like, uh, I've always known that I've kind of been like a a hubby type person, like I am a hub of information. And like, like, Mm. often like a center or a nucleus of like, um, many different connector, like people, uh, many different people, but like I am can be a nucleus of that, and then bring people together for specific projects or anything like that. So um, I just kind of like started reaching out to people who I thought would be an amazing fit. And it all just like lines up. 
right? And so like, I've always had this deal with God, right? Um, that if I exhaust all of the opportunities that the doors will open, right? And and yeah. I know that if if something starts falling into place easily, that that's the path I'm supposed to go, right? Because it, it makes sense. And it's like what I, I'm like, okay, I've put all my energy out, I've pulled all my feelers out. And then if something starts unfolding, I'm like, oh, that's where I'm supposed to go right now. And so that's, it felt very organic. It felt very divine. It felt very like next steppy. So, <clears throat> excuse me, it's snowing outside and it's um, gunky up in here. <laughs> um, so when I was in Princeton and um, I happened to be part of, <laughs> they called us the frozen chosen, right? There were, they would single cast all of the operas. Oh. Um and I was lucky enough to be one of the frozen chosen, mm -hmm. um, but it was not healthy, right? It pitted people in the department against each other. We had a huge department of not only undergrads, at, but uh, not only grads, but grads like at Westminster Choir College, like, like there's tons of vocal performance majors and these people need experience. So the third semester or my third year there, I was there for three years, I was like, uh, very attuned to that there were people who were getting ready to graduate from the school with their masters. Like my friend Hope had been there six years, undergrad and then grad, and oh, had wow. never had a lead role, only chorus, right? And um, I got really frustrated. <laughs> So I was like, uh, we reinstated the Graduate Student Association, which had been dormant for a while at Westminster. It had existed before, but it had been lying dormant. Nobody had done it. So we figured out how to reinstate it because then we could get money from the college. Yeah. Um, so I like ran <laughs> for president or whatever and like got hope to be a part of it, got a bunch of other people. And I was able to apply for $5,000 from the college and five or three, I don't know, three to $5,000. Um, so I put on uh, called Opera Exposed with Derek Goff and um, we were able to cast, I think it was like 45 people who had never had a role wow. um, in like two nights of 30 scenes. <laughs> That's awesome. And it was incredible. It was uh, unbelievable. And it was so amazing to be able to like just provide space and opportunity for these people who needed it, who had been paying, like everybody knows, yeah. uh, Westminster is a private university that is expensive, right? Yeah. And so like to, to leave and not have anything on your resume, which is where you're supposed to be getting experience. So that way you can get auditions. I mean, like you're paying for two degrees in performance. And if you're not getting any experience, like what's the point? And when like, does the domino fall? Cause it's all like, you've got to have this to be able to get into this, to be able to get into this. Exactly. The, um, Randall Alsup is one of my, my favorite thinkers in music and education. And uh, he actually did a, a teacher talk and we, we spoke briefly. He's got a really good book uh, out called Remixing the Music Classroom. Mm. And he talks so eloquently in it about the gatekeepers that exist in Ooh. in the industry of music and education and the arts in general, but yeah. particularly for educators, why do you have the authority and should you assume the role to tell someone, no, you can't, you're not good enough or you're not there yet or you need to study longer, you shouldn't be doing that. And especially from, if you take a step back from the industry, as it were, capital I industry, right? the um, commodification of the arts and all of that. I'm not, I'm not getting on that soapbox. It's right over there, but I'm not going to get on it. So if we take a step back from that and we just look global perspective, why would we not want more art in the world? Like period. Right. Like right. I'm not, I am not asking you. And I just had this conversation with someone about the struggle that all artists and educators are feeling right now. You know, should I do another virtual performance? Like we're, we're saturating the world right now with these virtual performances and people are feel like it's losing its potency and they don't mm -hmm. want to sort of quote unquote waste their time because it's inauthentic or there's lots of important dialogue happening with that. Yeah. So I was talking to someone who was essentially saying like, ah, 
it's not worth the trouble and all these things that I'm going to do. And besides, I don't know if my group could really handle the things I want to do right now. And so why do all that work to just put out like a mediocre recording? And I kind of had to stop them to say, but we need more art right now. We don't need less. And, right. and who is this person that you think is going to come police your YouTube video? Right. That's going to come and tell you, no, that's really not good enough. That's really not a, a great. You performed. You made music, period. Right. And I always herald the the church choir, you know, in loose quotes, like that is the mentality of making music that I want is that, mm -hmm. hey, everybody's welcome. Make a joyful noise. It might not always be in tune, but do something, do something rather than nothing. Yeah, it's it's uh, completely the the gatekeepers have installed the and, and perpetuated and taught this quality control. And like, I love quality control. Yeah. But there, to me, there's a difference between quality control and elitism. Yes. Right. And that's a huge thing that's still being taught in universities is that classical art is elitist. Right. Yeah. And, and being in Detroit, that's one of the very first things that we recognized, right? Is like, there are so many things that the classical artists needed to reprogram to be inclusive to the rest of Detroit, right? Even the first place where Upper Moda was in residence in Detroit, it was um, uh, the car center. And it we were the only white people to really be in residence there. You know, and like it, there were times where like there was a lot of butting of heads because we were running on classical time and they were running on jazz time, right? It was a, a, a cultural <laughs> place for jazz. And I was like, that's a systemic racism, you know, like we're yeah. running on white people time, right? Yeah. Um, and so, like, there was so much, um, initial conflict, then confrontation, then healing, then growth and knowledge, right? That we were blessed to have from the beginning of our time in Detroit, you mm -hmm. know? So I'm super grateful for that. Uh, I wanted to go back to the, um, so we made Opera Exposed um, and provided accessibility, but like the, 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 the partners who are in charge of the Opera department, I was their grad assistant, you know, yeah. and one of the frozen chosen, but they literally told me that they wouldn't do rape of Lucretia because my voice is very well suited to Lucretia, but then gestured to all of me. Like they, they said, well, she would sing the shit out of it, but, and then gestured to all of me. And then had a 30 minute call where they apologized and told me that there would never be enough money in the budget for costumes and props for Shut the audience the to believe that I was rapable. Are you kidding? This is trauma that, that launched me with my career to eating disorders, to trying to get hired to being told by my teacher that I would only ever sing Compra Mario because of I was fat and funny. And then to come here and Dr. DeKiara at Michigan Upper Theater told me like, to my face, like you found your niche singing fat, funny women, you know, like that's all you're gonna do in your career. And so having people in my life, like Cindy Sadler, who's yes. based in Austin, you know, like she, she and I actually had a very hard time together because she had just lost a bunch of weight um, when we started, when we sang in Susanna at Des Moines and I was, she was Mrs. Uh, McLean and I was Mrs. Ott and I was a young artist and she was on her high horse because she had just lost all of this weight and started coming at the other three of us who were all plus size. And we're like, if you don't lose weight, you're never going to be anything. And like, like holding it over and like, she's gained wow. some, you know, like she's battled her weight, like and like shit, shit on us and then had to come and apologize because she was like, I let that go to my head. And I let my success that I was receiving from the operatic community because they were praising me for my weight loss yeah. and providing me roles that I hadn't had access to, you know, and like she and I have this gorgeous relationship now and I'm so grateful for her human yes. existing. But like, that was very hard for me to like, 
watch somebody like lord their weight loss over me because they were like, look at all the success I have now that I've lost this weight, you know? I'm, it's surreal that yeah. it's opera and and theater, theater, broadly speaking, sort of theater, film, all of that. It's insane to me that you can just openly discriminate. That you oh, yeah. can hide behind roles and all in story to say like, well, this character has to be this color. This character has to be this size because of artistic integrity, because of whatever, you know, fallacy, because it really what it is, these things that we're making up that it just is astounding to me that it exists, that you can, that you can do that. And yeah, I just, it's amazing. Yeah. And you know, like it's, it's hard because like, I, I still love the humans that did that to me. Like I love the people who ran that program at Westminster, but like, I don't like the things that they did, exactly. you know, and it's hard because like that goes back to, them being gay men and gay men like perpetuating and defining what opera looked like for so long, mm -hmm. you know? And so like, that's a whole nother can of worms that <laughs> again, I'll put that can of worms to the side. <laughs> um, Cause that's a, mm -hmm, yes, big topic. Um, so all of that to say is, is like that is my own person. I wanted to sing the rep I wanted to sing. Yeah. And that my voice was created to sing whatever size I was, whatever I looked like, you know, and um, to advocate for others to also have that platform. Right. Like yeah. I've been blind casting for years. Like I'm there in the room, but like, and so is my artistic director, Steve, we're there in the room, but we give two craps about what you look like. Like, do you come in and do you sing the house down? Right. And like, I get so inspired when people come in and sing the house down, like not minimalizing themselves, like singing yeah. something that they've been told that they're not supposed to sing because of their size. Right. Coming in and like singing a, a romantic lead at any size, like anybody can be a romantic lead. Um, race, ethnicity, size, whatever. So yeah. it's, it's, it's turned into something so different from when I first founded it, but it was still those same things. Going back to like the Princeton founding, um, Derek Goff and Tom Kaleo um, were a huge influence of collaboration for me there. And the, it was, it was weird, like going back to how Aaron felt about like, always having to do pay to sings mm -hmm. that we were providing this free thing because I couldn't afford to pay them, but they weren't having to pay. We had like very weird reactions from the singers. They didn't quite understand. <laughs> right. They were like, I'm not paying, but I'm giving my time, but I'm not getting paid. Like they didn't quite get it. And even yeah. now, like we are, are working on, you know, like hustling for, we're a nonprofit now, we're like working on getting grants and everything post COVID. Um, and we've always made it a commitment to pay an honorarium since we've been in Detroit. Like I was like, we're gonna do this. And at first it came out of my pocket, wow. right? Yeah. Because like Moto's my baby. And I was like, I wanna make sure that people understand that I acknowledge their time is worth money and that this isn't a pay to sing, but like, because of, the information I gained in um, Princeton, those three years of not being able to pay them, uh, we were able to pay like sometimes like shows would get sponsored and we would be able to. But um, it, it's very interesting watching singers react. And even with an honorarium, some of them are like, why are you paying me $5? I would rather do this for free. And I'm like, it's, it's a bit, it, I'm still having a hard time. Like <laughs> you can't please everybody. Yeah. Um, but it's also like unpacking of that culture of where they've been treated like they have to pay to have any sort of space. Yeah. Even though that they've paid thousands of dollars in degrees and training and coaching and dramatic coaching and then keep paying until they get into a young artist program that pays them. And even then, sometimes it's like $5. So it's like, there's so much like healing that needs to happen for them to really understand their worth. Like, yeah. uh, and so um, Steve and I really try <laughs> to also, when people get cast in shows, not just like 
do the show with them, but also like plant seeds of healing of self-worth and, and, yeah. and, and worth of, uh, how is your artist worthy and, and that you deserve to be here and you deserve so much more money, but we're not able to give you that right now. And thank yeah. you for being patient for us with us on, on that journey. And it's, it's so crazy to see the trauma and the, the healing that needs to happen because of how opera has been set up. And I get really frustrated that the universities perpetuate that yeah. instead of start the healing and, and start breaking it uh, at, at that level, right? Instead of perpetuating, right? Like the, it, it, it's changed so much. Like I'm like opera has changed a lot, like post HD, right? Mm. That's when everybody started caring about what everybody looked like. And um, they expected you to look like you were in film. And that's a whole nother thing. Like mm -hmm. that should also be inclusive. Um, but like there, there was like this like carved out wheelhouse of like, you go to undergrad, you go to grad school, you do summer, like summer festivals there, whatever you do some yaps and then you have a career. And then some of the people I know who had that path, like their voices were busted. Yeah. Like, because they were expected to do all of that before around 25 and then their voices have like a huge dynamic shift anatomically at 25 yeah. and then again you know like they were expected to do all these things and their their like instruments aren't even in their prime right like after 40 is when your voice like really <laughs> settles especially for like dramatic instruments so there's there's so much to unpack and unravel there but to me opera hasn't been safe for a long time yeah and uh that is one of Moto's like main things is safety, mm -hmm. right? And and to provide that space of a, a place to try out and hone your craft and to fail. And a lot of people don't feel that even in university or a young artist program, they feel like yeah. they have to be perfect. And it's like, how do you become the artist you're supposed to be if you're always trying to be perfect and like you don't feel like it's okay to get messy and you don't feel like it's okay to fail and have the safe and the the safety and the space to do that. Yeah. So that's what we're trying to provide. And we've really our our mission is shifting um as we like we just became professional members of Opera America, which is amazing. And um we're we're shifting to professional, but we always want to have that like teachable side of where and and the safety side you know and so we're navigating how that looks of like do we still double cast and one is with all professionals and one is with young artists who can learn from many ways of like see being double cast with the professionals and we we have a lot of stuff moving forward of what we want to do but we still want to always provide that like safe and space uh safety and space to grow and learn um and heal like we have, like, there have been so many traumas that we have helped mm. been a part of healing. Yeah. From people who have did, who didn't even want to keep going because they felt like they couldn't be an artist because of what they looked like or, you know, like uh, size or color. That's, yeah. That's actually how we ended up fi uh, founding the, um, George Shirley Diversify Opera Resident Artist Program, which is a mouthful. <laughs> um, but Nicole Joseph um, is this incredible soprano. She um, sings all over. Um, she sings with, um, what's the choral group that's based out of Austin? Sa Conferrare. Conferrare, yeah. yeah. She's like one of their go-to soloists and nice. sopranos and um one of the most incredible voices I've ever heard, like literally moves me on a visceral level. Mm. Like literally she, her voice has a direct line to my heart. Ooh, <laughs> I won't cry. <laughs> um, and then on top of that, she's one of the most amazing humans ever created. So she was uh, cast as Gretel when we did um, Bon Appetit. We like put pieced a bunch of stuff together and she was one of the Gretels and she was very like in rehearsal. She was very like perfect, 
right? And then we would go for break and then she would be like popping and locking and like doing all this awesome like dancing. And I'd be like, that's Gretel. That's your Gretel. I need, that's your playful Gretel. And she was like, no, I have to like present. And she came wow. from the line, like she studied with Shirley Verrett and, and she came from the line of, of African-American teachers, which was great that she had that exposure but that they had to fight so hard to get noticed and seen mm. and be included that they had to be beyond perfect. Like yeah. they, they were told, like they literally had to whitewash themselves yeah. to be hired. And, and they would get like, again, like they would get more, more opportunities, the more they whitewashed themselves. Like when, when Cindy lost her weight, she would get more opportunities. And then that like wow. shows that tells you like, oh, I must be doing something right. Like this is, this is how it should exactly. be. It affirms Perpetuate, the yeah. Right. So she is literally the inspiration and catalyst for that um, space making because I was like that. And, and she, <laughs> after we had that conversation, she had to take me to lunch and, and like figure out like my intentions. Hmm. She was like, what are your intentions with this like why do you care about this and and i was like i feel like which is a sign of her trauma correct yeah <laughs> and i was like this is my spiritual gift one of them that i've been blessed with is is advocation and place making right and like it, for everyone and every ethnicity and like because i am loud <laughs> But also I feel like because I have the empathy to do so, right? Mm -hmm. I'm able to see, and the privilege, right? At the end of the day, yeah. I have yeah. my privilege and I'm able to do that. And so I feel in, extraordinarily convicted to take that privilege and use it um, it, uh, however I can. Um, so she, uh, it was just like this amazing conversation where we built trust <laughs> that that she allowed that she that she allowed me to hold her through all of this and like i'm most definitely gonna cry <laughs> um mm. to watch the artist she has become is unbelievable um she most recently the last show that we did before COVID closed she was blanche in dialogue of the carmelites and she was our Magda and console. And she, I mean, like she just is like one of the greatest storytellers I've ever seen acting. Mm -hmm. And then to have it married with that voice that has that direct line to your heart. Like to me, I mean, she is a superstar, but yeah. she literally having to like claw her way to get Comper Mario roles at Michigan Opera Theater to get, like she sang um, with their touring group for so long, you know, and like that she's had to like have these like, put from the outside, it looks like that she's been like, oh, here you can have this bone. Here I've, I've got this crumb for you, yeah. right? Instead of somebody being like, holy crap, you are unreal. You should be everywhere. Yeah. Like, and, and I don't have, unfortunately, because opera is based on class systems still, I don't have the funds to be able to do that for her. Yeah. And I, so I do as much as I can in every way possible without having the trust fund to be able to perpetuate her career in this way, you know, and, and that's a whole nother thing too. It's like, you have to have money or access or privilege to have a career in this elite. Like it truly is elite because of yeah. how it's been set up and structured. So does she have a, a like a professional site? Uh, yeah, Nicole Joseph Soprano. Because I put in there, um, some people have already seen it, uh, the link for the Operamoto website. And so definitely feel free to patronize and go on. Um, uh, you might be able to make a donation, but at least you can get plugged in and find out what Operamoto is doing. But I will, perfect, I got it. I will throw in Nicole's website as well for people that are watching uh, because this is how we do it. Although it seems small, become a fan 
right? <laughs> like and subscribe, like whatever yeah. you can do, support these artists. And there's there's so much that you said, but I, I wanted to highlight on two things. Sure. One of it was the significance of um, uh, Maxine Green is another one of my favorite thinkers. And, and Randall actually got to study with her at Columbia and he took over for her. And one of my favorite quotes from her is, I am forever on my way. <laughs> and she was she was really big yeah. about the idea that the minute we assume that we're done, right, we've stopped growing and it, we completely lose the point. And opera is one of those unfortunate genres that people assume all operas were written in the 18th and 19th century and we don't right. need to worry about it anymore. And yeah. it, it becomes stagnant. And then it just everything piles on top of that. Yeah. And it's really unfortunate because there's there's so much to be learned and to explore in that genre. And gratefully, I've been exposed to places in which people are starting to push the boundaries, but unfortunately you have to dig to find it and it hasn't become sort yeah. of well known, but it's the idea that in the arts in general, and I've had this conversation with too many people, that you know, once you play that concerto, once you sing that aria, once you get to perform with that ensemble, you've quote unquote made it. <laughs> I understand it, but at right. the same time, I sort of like, I rebuke it because I'm like, no, because then you have created an end. Right. You know, there's the, the famous Pablo Casals quote when he was in his nineties and they say, why do you still practice every day? And he goes, well, because I think I'm making progress. Like yeah, exactly. that's <laughs> the point is that yep. that's, what's beautiful about the arts. You're never done. There's yep. always something more to do. And the experiences that you're talking about, one of the reasons, because there are several, one of the reasons they're so toxic is because they perpetuate that mentality that once I get this break, once this person graces me with this opportunity, then I can get into this next echelon and then I can have, but we're put, yeah. we're making the barriers and they don't exist. They're all right. man-made. They're yes. all there because someone else decided that that was going to be the barrier. And we hide behind, and I want to call this out for what it is, we hide behind this fallacy of standards. And oh, yeah. I'm, I'm really, it literally pisses me off because it's perpetuated in music education that, but if we get rid of this system, then we lose the standard. Like, I don't understand that because the standards either. are things that we made. Right. The like, structure is broken and new structures can be written at any time. Exactly. Like if, if you're not advocating for growth in the structure, you're perpetuating the old structure. Yeah. You know, and like, it's the same local, local restaurant that has like, literally it's the only place I'll eat during COVID because they have outdoor seating and all of their standards are incredibly high. And it's yeah. the only place I feel safe to. Right. Nice. And with everything unraveling and it's starting to get warmer and like, stuff happening in in michigan about people storming the the governor you know like all of the stuff like there's been like repercussions that ripple out in society and like there have been like crazy people who have showed up and like pushed so many boundaries or just ignored the boundaries that were happening and so like they're constantly like rewriting and evaluating their structures in place to make sure that everybody is having the safest experience possible mm -hmm. because they're all about like protection and evolution. And I think this is a, a, a bigger subject of like, we're taught to not create boundaries for ourselves um, and or that individualism versus the societal, right? Like to me, that's what that goes back to is like, we aren't, protecting the collective as a whole because our individual means so much more than that yeah and and um i think that that has happened everywhere and it's like leaked into all of it there was something else i was gonna say and i forgot it's okay <laughs> oh <laughs> come back, come back. yes um <clears throat> you know during covid steve my artistic director of the moto artistic director we had very frank conversations of, like we always do, but like mm -hmm. with Black Lives Matter, with everything that was happening with the President 45, you know, like there was so many things that were finally, we had the time and space to have the conversation because of COVID. Mm -hmm. And we were like, we don't know if we wanna still have the word opera in our name. Oh, wow. 
Yeah. Because we don't know if we actually believe in this canon anymore. Wow. Uh, I know. <laughs> no, that's huge. And so, and, and we are still moving forward with it for now, but we don't know. Um, but that's why we fought so hard, honestly, to become full professional members of Opera America because Opera America has grants for new works. Mm. And we want to be that. We love nothing more than taking stuff from the operatic canon and rewriting the story to be relevant. But that takes work and we need to be paid for that work, right? We've done three shows like that and haven't been able to like pay the, the librettists and or ourselves for the work of the concept and the rewriting. And so we want to be able to do that to say, hey, we actually have work here and we have money to pay you for that. And like, let's keep making, let's keep uh, advancing this canon, you know, like let's keep yeah. perpetuating it forward. Let's change the script literally to, to not be, you know, like when people think of the operatic canon, like look at all the stuff that's done. It's based on like misogyny, patriarchy and rape. And like, there isn't stuff that like breaks that. And so like, we have this new Don Pasquale that um, we didn't get to do. And so we'll do once post COVID where it's a cast of all four men and a cast of all four women. Right. And so it's Whoa. Don Pasquale and Donna Pasquale and they're boomers like who run like a tech corporation, right? Oh and Ernesto or Ernesta are both non-binary presenting and uh, Pasquale doesn't get it and keeps calling them by their dead name and keeps calling them by the wrong pronouns. And then there's like, wow. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> and my incredible roommate, um, my incredible roommate, Pat, um, is a BFA graduate from Wayne State, and they are non-binary, and they um, were part of our Chenna Rental that we rewrote, and I just happened to talk to them about it, and the the three of us with Steve were like, oh, yeah, Pat's interested, and Pat has written this in gorgeous, incredibly relevant script for the new version, for, but with Donizetti's music. I love it. I, we do too. And but we're so excited to be able to do that. But I also want to be able to pay Pat for the work that they put in, <laughs> you yeah. know, and I want them to keep doing it because like they figured out in this process, like how good they are at this because they are a musician too. And they're like, like, it was so amazing to me to like watch them, like sitting at my keyboard, like playing out the recitative and like singing the, what they wrote, yes. you know, like it was an amazing process to watch. Um, and to be able to like, also inspire them to do that's this. All they that's something that the they never, yeah. right, exactly. Well, and that's what modo means in Italian is opportunity, Yeah. right? And and I feel like that's also, you know, like that's, that's what we do is like, you wanna learn something, you will have an idea for like, let's figure it out. Like how let's, even if we don't get how to do it, like if you wanna come be our props mistress and, and you don't know how to do it, but you've always been interested, like, Let's, I will do that with you. Like, I yeah. will, like, let's do it together. Let, let's figure it out together. Um, well, and I don't, I don't want this to sound sacrilegious, but I, I really feel the need to pull on two theological terms because this is what it reminds me of. I feel like opera in general, but insert art form here, because this could be classical music with a big C, this could be jazz, it could be rock and roll. Um, I feel like we, especially when we look at pillars of the industry slash the genre mm -hmm. that are predominantly Western European from the 19th century, I feel like we fail to do the hermeneutics or the exegesis. And again, I don't mean to be sacrilegious, but the idea that yeah. I use those theological terms because we are essentially worshiping false idols. We have created in in the the context of the meaning of the word sorry to get preachy on a sunday but like we've made a religion out of these art forms we really mm -hmm. have where mm -hmm. we are worshiping these old texts these old manuscripts and works and we're looking at these libretti and saying 
look at the opportunities and we have to stay as true as possible to it when if you look at it hermeneutically if you just look at it in context it's like no this like donizetti was writing about life yeah in his context and what yep. was going on and newsflash we don't live in 19th century italy like we don't we so don't <laughs> we have to take that the point of the art form was to be reflective and although Sorry, not sorry. I'm not a huge Mozart opera fan. Like there are moments, but I'm just not. Like I do think that Mozart gave great examples to that. You know, like the magic flute was like batshit crazy. People were like, what's happening? Oh, with this? Yeah. But people were able to say, like, cool, here's an opportunity for me to tell a story and to create this. And not that Mozart is the example, but I think a great example of like, yeah, we should be doing that because that was the point of those operas being produced after the church finally let go its iron grip of it. And you right. know, they didn't let it go. They were forced to do so. Hello, opera history. Like the, the time that people finally said, let's walk away from the sacred and use this art form to tell our story and what's going on. And we somehow like lost. And I say somehow, obviously facetiously, because we know why it happened. It was right. driven by money and how opera houses could be established and how they could become elitist. But it frustrates the hell out of me that I meet people that assume that they're being, you know, purists or traditionalists or look down on people like, I don't understand how they could change the the time setting of that or how they could rewrite the libretto and go, do you really understand why that opera was even written? Do you right. understand why the art form became as popular as it was? There were no movies. Right. Th th this was entertainment. Well, this and it still is like everywhere but America. Yeah. Like opera is seen as like a dirty word. Like, ew, opera? What? Like, and it's like people go to the opera in Europe like once a week, every other week. Yeah. You know, like it's not like a special occasion where you dress up like you, it's like going to the movies for them. We have made it societally elitist in America, right? Yeah, We're absolutely. the ones who have done that and perpetuated that and who have like, and, and the people who say those things are of, to me, like that last generation who are trying to uphold these things that aren't the same. Like look at the incredible new works that are always done in Europe. And to make and to retell these stories and make it fresh. And as soon as somebody tries to bring that to America, oh no, we don't do that here. Yeah. Right? That's a bunch of crap. Like we should be doing that there. We should be retelling these stories and pushing those boundaries. But we have made it because we don't have 12 operas that we do in, within our calendar year because we can't afford it or that's not how it's done or people don't come enough, you know, whatever excuse it yeah. is. Yeah. We still have like the elitist mentality of like, let's keep this precious. And it's important for people to know, we kind of touched on this a little earlier uh, when we talked about the, the defense of standards. I think what, what I find really frustrating is trying to have this dialogue with the people that can make the change, artistic directors, executive directors, people that can make the change, um, patrons for that matter, that like, hey, you support this, why don't you support this? Yeah. This idea of, well, I, I appreciate this type of artwork or this platform so much that I don't want it to die away. And that always frustrates me because I'm like, How's, how fragile is this thing that you are so desperate to protect that you assume if anything else exists that this will crumble? And shouldn't that then be a moment to think critically, should this still exist if it but is this fragile so I don't get that, that, this idea of, but if there are new operas and if there are these small companies and if there are these other things, and this is not just opera. I mean, this is especially as an orchestra conductor, I feel like I suffer this fate. Like, right. but you have to play Be Beethoven with your orchestra. Like, but why? Right. Like, exactly. Trust me, Beethoven's going to stay around. Right. Like my, yeah. my college Beethoven's orchestra not, not playing anywhere. Beethoven this year. It's not going to, Beethoven should not be so fragile. It's right. not going to happen that the the life and history of his accomplishments have been destroyed right? because my students never performed it. And it's not gonna serve my ensemble well, it's not gonna serve the music well, so why would I do it? Yeah, right. but I just wanna hear the classics. No, what you want to hear is what you were taught was right. important. Yeah. That's what you want to hear. I want to encourage you to see that there are other things that are important. And this is, hopefully this doesn't sound braggadocious, but I, cause I am, I am stealing this opportunity from a colleague that invited me to it 
So like my college orchestra right now, we are spending this quarter learning bluegrass music. Yeah. And we are performing bluegrass music as an orchestra with yes. contemporary arrangers that are creating orchestral arrangements of bluegrass music. And so many of my students have come in and are coming from a quote unquote sort of traditional classical background because they're predominantly string players. And they're like, I didn't know anything about this. And we're, again, shameless plug, we're studying the music of Martha Redbone, absolutely extraordinary African-American, Native American artist who uses bluegrass. She grew up in Kentucky and so considers bluegrass her music and her voice and yeah. performs in this style where she's not fully appreciated and has done these incredible albums and released an album of bluegrass arrangements. I mean, imagine th this to me is the stuff that I live for. A, a half black, half native um, American artist who has written original works in a bluegrass style, uh, style of William Blake poetry. Oh my gosh, that's like, amazing. That's cool. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's America for me. Yeah. Like, that's my America is like, yep. how can I see myself through what has existed? Yep. And we're, we're going to get to the, we have arrangers we're working with that are arranging a string orchestral accompaniment to these works that she's done. So we're using a traditionally Western European classical instrumental ensemble to back this bluegrass artist doing romantic English literature. Like I was like, this is it. This, yeah. How is this hurting anyone? It's how is not. this not just <laughs> celebrating the beauty of the diversity that we can have? And that it just gets to me because I don't understand these hills that people are worth dying on yeah. in the in arts education that but you have to do this no, no. you might think you have to do it but yeah. i can promise you that my students i want my students to make music that's what i want them to do that's yeah. my number one priority so if they're not doing your music or who's ever be, they're still making music that should be my goal yeah well yes exactly and it's interesting like that uh these hills that like the sponsors and donors are worth dying on that they're not even looking at the inside of the business because yeah. like the opera inside has moved so far back, like uh, so far past those hills. Like if you really wanted that to happen, then you should be bankrolling artists who need to break in and don't have trust funds. Right. Because like the, and like going back to like how, uh, like let's take like the Joan Sutherland, Callis, Marilyn Horn era. Right. Mm. So like they had agents and or managers that found them and then curated them. Mm. Right. Like found them um, all of the coaches they needed and, and like protected them to not sing repertoire that they shouldn't sing because of like anatomical growth and all of these things that they really like nurtured and were with the artist like as as a long career thing now we have like a like agent managers who like pretty much just book your gigs right and they don't to me aren't even necessary right like i i want to and i know that this is like um, I don't know if it'll ever happen, but I think that a huge shift should be that the opera houses should have the manager and that they act as like the casting director wow, and then yeah. they bring it in and that we're all independent artists. Well, right? there's, so there's, that there's everybody can apply. Yeah. I was just going to give you the compliment you deserve. There's such a beautiful parallel to what you're describing because what you have managed to establish through Moto is what you aspire agents to do. You mm -hmm. have this gift of being able to connect people and do, and that's that's what's terrifying is it's just another form of gatekeeping is what agents do because they do have the connections. And so then you get introduced to them and they're able to you know put you in contact with the quote unquote right people. But I love to see people yep. like yourself who are saying, no, because it is a gift, it is a talent. I won't deny that. There's some very talented agents and managers, but when I can see people like yourself that are able to say, no, I'm going to use that gift, but I'm going to give it freely and I'm going to connect people because it, it only benefits everyone rather yeah. than me protecting it. It's going to help push boundaries. And so not that I have any sort of 
authority or this holds any weight, but I thank you personally as an artist and an educator for doing that work because yeah. it is selfless and it is it is unrewarding in towards in terms of monetary compensation because you could you could absolutely be charging out the wazoo to do the things that you're doing yeah. but you have answered a calling to do that and i say that only to reiterate we're not meant to be martyrs and it's right. frustrating that you have to be in that position and that you are gracious enough to still give with your gifts and i'm i don't i only want to mention it and i don't necessarily want to go down this rabbit hole but you had said this earlier and i and i want to say before we leave the the scenario that you have talked about, the many scenarios you've talked about, um, unfortunately are not just getting perpetuated in opera and in, in vocal performance studies, but it's something that I see the church doing quite a bit as well. And that, and I just want to mention that to people that are listening, it's not okay for you to be used by the church with your gifts. It's yeah. not okay. And I was raised in an environment where I was told word for word, God blessed you with that gift. So you have to give it back to him. That's your offering. And it wasn't until I was in my twenties, a shout out to the word of life church in central Texas and Kyle, Texas, that my, my good friend, um, Justin Payne is going to be taking over of as lead pastor and pastor Jacobs, who's retiring, sat me down one day because they were just like you're saying, you know, they were giving me like, I was like 20, 30 bucks uh, every Sunday. And I had the mentality of like, no, 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 I'll just do this for free. This is me giving back to God. Like, this is my gift. And this pastor sat me down and told me what I needed to know and was like, no, I don't think you understand. People sow seeds into this church and you are a part of their experience and their communion with God as one of our musicians. Mm -hmm. And I am making the choice to invest the gifts of God back to you. I am making the choice to thank God for giving you those talents. This is my choice to give you money to mm -hmm. honor you for the things that you're doing. You might say you're doing it for free or you're doing it to the glory of God, and that's fantastic. But I'm also doing something to honor the things that God has done in you. And again, I don't intend to be so preachy on a Sunday, but it's it bothers me that we can't take that framework, which should be institutionalized, mm -hmm. rather than the idea of like, well, you owe it to the church to sing for free or to play for free. Oh, yeah. Say, no, no one owes anyone anything in these industries of the arts in general, that you don't have to paint that mural for free. You don't have to compose or arrange that music for free. There should be an expectation of you have gifts and you have agency over those gifts. And yep. I don't get to blackmail you or laud it over you, you. You need the opportunity or I'm giving you an opportunity to be in front of whomever it is because people are going to digest your art. They're going to consume it. Yeah. And so it needs to be reciprocal. And I just, I wanted to speak into that. I just have the feeling that someone will listen to this and, and not make that connection that it's, it's definitely not just an opera and institutions that have power, which churches tend to do. And it's not just one denomination that they, they tend to laud that over us that like, well, yeah. you need the, you know, I'm going to say the dirty word, you know, the exposure you need the exposure and that's what we're willing to give you. And it's just, I am grateful for what technology has done to liberate so many artists that, you know, and, and I know this is controversial and loosely related um, in terms of the dichotomy that exists between popular music and opera, and they don't need to be separate, mm -hmm. trying to break down those barriers. But I, I used to have this um, resentment towards a lot of pop artists that are the the YouTube artists, right? Or like the the TikTok artists where they made their careers. Billie Eilish is the one that freaking love me some Billie Eilish. Like she's someone that I love to herald as like, yeah, you can have talent and you can arguably in the 21st century make it. Mm -hmm. And this idea that you had to have the agent or someone had to give you the opportunity to get on stage, yep. it doesn't exist anymore. And, and even though there's there's so much to be said there, I'm grateful that technology has become a tool to liberate artists to say, I'm just going to put it out there and people can like it and they can subscribe to it. And I will then gain agency in my career to be able to say, no, I have the success that I want. And if anybody, yeah. if you ever have the time, look into Billie Eilish has so many great interviews and, and stuff like it's amazing to hear her talk about that journey with her brother, who's an extraordinary producer and composer to say like, no, we, we have our music. We put it out there. You know, and that's if people like it, they like it. But there's not again, there is no termination to my ambition. 
Mm -hmm. I'm not just trying to get signed. I'm just trying to make music and put it out there. Yep. Like how much better could this world be if we all just wanted to make music and put it out there? And that's on period. Like (laughs) the end. We just want to make music and put it out there. Yep. My goodness. I can't believe it's already been an hour. I know. (laughs) It's insane (laughs) to me. Same. Um, I want to honor your time because I know you are very busy and have a ton of stuff to do, but I cannot thank you enough for coming and talking with me today. And again, thank you for doing this amazing work. For people that are seeing this, whether you're seeing it um, on our playlist with all of our archived episodes, or if you were watching it today, please feel free to share and get in contact. Uh, reach out to Danielle, uh, look up Nicole Joseph, and and get connected to the work that's happening. Again, this is not just about soliciting donations. I think that's the, the minimum of what we can do, if I'm being honest. Right. I think this is about just getting connected. If you're inspired by this work, um, I know Danielle well enough not to throw any (laughs) work towards her, but she will respond. She will talk to you and she is such an inspirational human being. She will let you know, yeah, this is how you can do it. And this is the work she's called to do. So get connected, reach out to her, reach out to me and let's keep the conversation going. Go challenge the people you're working with to do more, make more music, make more art and let's space, safe space. Yes. Make these spaces. (laughs) So, uh, again, Danielle, thank you so much. I'm going to give you a personal uh, salutation when I end the live feed. But to everyone else, thank you for watching. Look forward to seeing you again next week. Bye.